Terrell Thomas, these every time. I'm sitting down with a young lady where I'm quite sure you've heard her melodies, you've heard her music over time. Uh, so it's a beautiful thing to actually be able to put face to those notes and those harmonies. She's recently been on the road. She has new music out, so many things going on. So it's great to sit down and speak with you. Torka, how are you today? I'm awesome. How are you? I'm magnificent. I appreciate your time. I appreciate you coming down and, and rocking with us and just giving us some updates about some things that have recently been going on with you. Yes, so thank you for having me. I, there's an array of things in which I want to talk to you about just to give our audience and give your fans a little bit more of an in-depth history of who you are. But I know as we're in the fourth quarter, I'll say, of 2023, it's been a very good year for you. Most, More specifically, uh, the last few months have been really dope for you. Yes. You were recently on tour. Um, talk to me about that experience, how that all came about. Yes, so I just got off of the Still Having Mood Swings Part 2 tour with my brother Vito. Shout out to Vito. And we did, well, I did 13 cities. It was 18 cities all together. Okay. But due to some other scheduling conflicts, I wasn't able to do every single city, which I was kind of sad about. But the 13 cities that we did, it was super crazy. Like, sold out shows. It was very exciting. It was so much fun. Um, Vito's fiance actually used to do my hair, so now she okay. does my brows and lashes. And when I saw that he was going on tour, I reached out to her and was like, hey, you know, I really want to do this tour. So I, they put me in contact with his manager, who I also knew for a long time. And they were like, oh, it's a no-brainer. Like, let's do it. So it was like being on tour with family. So it was really fun. Okay, okay. And Vito gave me a lot of pointers because that was the first time I've done, like, a consecutive, like, amount of days on a tour. I've been, I've done spot dates on tours before, but never, like, actually doing a whole run. So he um, gave me some pointers. I adjusted some of my set for like the second leg of the tour, but I learned a lot about myself. Um, I learned a lot about my fans and the audience and a lot of them were already my fans, but they didn't know it until I actually came out and performed. And then by the time I got to the end of my set, they were like, oh, you the girl for second me a lolly, come on. <laughs> <laughs> so it was really cool. Yeah. Was there a city or a moment on tour that really, really stood out to you or where you had like a, Hmm, this all makes sense type of moment. Are you trying to get me in trouble with the fans, huh? No, not at all. Not at all. Um, so I will say the first city we did was Milwaukee, okay. which was super, super lit. Like the energy was crazy. I don't get nervous before I perform, but I can definitely say I was nervous that night because like the first night of the <laughs> wow. tour, I had just flown in. I flew straight from the airport, straight to the venue. I didn't have any time like to really process what was happening so I had to like get dressed do my hair do my makeup and go on the stage so I really okay. didn't have time to like you know meditate or anything before so that was definitely nerve-wracking but the audience was very receptive they were very open so it was a good city to start in because you know they kind of set the tone for the rest of the tour but um another city that stood out to me was OKC their energy was crazy like I love OKC um I will say Memphis was definitely a memorable stop um I'm no longer saying Megan knees. I'm going to say Memphis knees because the girls <laughs> in Memphis, they were twerking the entire night. Gospel, R&B, rap, like whatever song, they were twerking to everything. And they were twerking for hours That's straight. Hilarious. That's hilarious. So sorry, Megan, no shade, but Memphis got them knees. Um, and lastly, I think my favorite city was, um, one of my favorite cities was Houston. Houston's energy was crazy. It was the last night of my um, stops on the tour and I also went to my hometown which is Columbia South Carolina so that was definitely lit to be able to come back to the city that I'm from and perform and be on tour was like a full circle moment for me I'm glad that you actually mentioned that uh, you mentioned South Carolina yes. and of course we're here in Atlanta Atlanta is home now but that is not where you were where you were raised where you became right. a woman when you fell in love with music so what was your upbringing like in South Carolina what was the music scene like and when did you know that you could have a career or a passion for music well, I've always been an entertainer in my family. Like holiday times, they were like, okay, dance, sing, da da da. So I was always performing at like holiday family functions, but I had my little bucket on the side, like, mm -mm, I don't work for free. Let me get some coins, put a little 20 in there, a little $5 bill or something. But um, I started singing in church, like in the choir. I was just singing in the choir. But one day the choir director heard me singing in the hallway, and he was like, oh, you can sing, sing. He was like, okay, there's no more hiding in the background. I'm gonna put you on, on Front Street. Like, you gotta do a solo. And I was like, no, I'm scared. So he ended, ended up convincing me to do it. And when I finished singing, I, I performed that song the whole time with my eyes closed. And when I finished singing and I opened my eyes, everybody in the church was standing up because they had never heard me sing before. So they had seen me singing in choir, but never like solo. Okay. So that feeling and just seeing people smiling, clapping, some people were crying. I just got addicted to that 
feeling. So I was just like, oh, this is what I want to do. And here we are. You kind of hinted out there a moment ago when you were talking about being on tour and some of your memories. Like, oh, you're the lady from Sick of Being Lonely. Mm -hmm. uh, very popular Grammy-nominated song. Thank you. And you are the voice uh, behind that, the vocalist behind that. How did that opportunity come about, and what, what was that experience like? Um, that was through a chance encounter meeting Jazzy Faye. I used to work out at the Noontime Studios um, way back in the day, and it was me, Polo the Don, when, they were, when he was in Jim Crow, okay. Brian Michael Cox, Jazzy had a, a, a room in the studio, Teddy Bishop, like all of these you know, up and coming uh, producers who are now like Grammy award winning and you know, all these accolades, but we all kind of came up together. So um, the opportunity presented itself and Jazzy called me like, hey, I got this uh, rap duo that's signed to Geffen and MCA and they have this song, I want you to get on it and sing the hook. And I was like, okay. So that was actually my first professional recording that song. It took okay. me like 30 minutes to record that and then um, the song just took off like a month later the record label was like okay we need you here we need you to fly to la go to new york go to florida so we just it was like a runaway hit we weren't expecting it um i was very green i didn't really know anything about the music business i knew how to sing but i didn't know about the business so i kind of like it was like a sink or swim i just learned as i went along so yeah do you when you hear the record now does it put you in a different space do you realize like the growth in which you you have as an artist and as a woman from then like where where does your mind go when you hear the record being played now because you can still hear it in the club or when yes, somebody you know that's, sure. it's a timeless record thank you um i definitely didn't realize the impact that the song had until now because back then there was no social media so there was no way to see how the song was doing in different markets different cities how people were connecting to it unless we went and performed in those cities we didn't perform in every single city in the country so it was hard to really gauge who was really listening to the song so when i went back after the song kind of died down and i saw like our chart positions on Billboard and like all the radio stations that were playing our songs and how many times it played on 106 and Park and BT and VH1 and MTV, I was like, wow, this song was way bigger than I thought. But it's like when you're inside, like when you're from the outside looking in, it's easy to see. But when you're actually doing it, we're just working. We're just showing up where we're told to be sh to perform. And, you know, we don't really understand like how big the song is until like it's you're looking back like, damn, we really killed it so my biggest flex is that i was successful before social media been that girl beneficial okay and still that's a great flex so <laughs> I, I i'm not mad at that at all i do know and around 2012 or so now you put out a project a beautiful mess yes um, i did your research i'll play with you i mean I, I knew who you were before the interview with you know yeah so you know See? Mm -hmm. um big flex beautiful project there but i, I want you to kind of go back into history or back to the future uh, when you were actually putting that project out and also explain to me how you feel like you've grown as an artist from then to now you're asking really good questions oh i appreciate that yeah um a beautiful mess was honestly my um my message to myself like because a lot of people were putting me in a box like oh she's just a hook singer or, oh she's just a songwriter you know i was getting in this background space like people were just like oh that's my home girl girl next door like really comfortable really familiar but um i put that project out to kind of prove to myself that i was more than a hook singer and i could make an actual project so that was my debut studio album i had never recorded an album before i found some producers that i really loved rocking with and we just put that whole album together i wrote every song on it um, we came up with all the arrangements the artwork the creative direction. I was doing everything. I was like the A&R, the executive producer, the artist, the writer. So that song was really like my coming out song, like my coming out album. Okay. Like, it's me, I'm Torica, I'm more than just a hook singer. Because a lot of people were just like, oh, you're the sick of being lonely girl. So at first that was cool, but then I was like, okay, I don't want to just be known as this one thing, like just be attached to just this. So I had to show people like I could do more than that. So yeah, as far as my growth, um, I think that my music now is a reflection of the experiences I've had in life since Sick of Me and Lonely came out to now. So I'm definitely more mature. I'm definitely more confident. I know who I am as a woman. I'm a mom now. Um, I'm a businesswoman. I've had a lot of experiences. So I would say if I had to describe my music now, it's life experience R&B. So it's about some real shit that I've actually been through that I know other women are going through and have been through, or they might be going to, like, going to go through in the future. So. Yeah. Being a mother now and being a parent, has that had an impact or like how has it influenced the music and what you put out, the music that you listen to? Uh, I'm quite sure that, you know, as time goes on, 
your children will be able to hear mommy's music, you know, what she was singing about, what she may have stood for, the messages in her music. So how has motherhood impacted your sound? Um, well, I don't make music for kids, but I will say that my music, um, it's its just about real life. So I'm not hiding who I am in my music. I'm not, you know, editing my music because I'm a mom. I am very aware of how I present myself because I have daughters and I, I have a son. That. So I want my children to see me and respect me and see that I respect myself. But I also want them to understand I'm an adult. So there may be things that I sing about or words that I use that are not appropriate for them. but you know, when they become adults one day, they can use my music as a guide to help them through their romantic relationships. So, yeah. Very well said. I respect the hell out of that. Thank I damn sure respect the hell out of that. <laughs> now, we are in a time period where you are releasing new music. Yes. And you have a new record out right now. Uh, you're getting, yeah, you're getting people funky, asking them to dance with you, you yes. know. Uh, talk to me about your new record and how that all came about. So, Dance With Me is really just, um, a lot of times in relationships, Women and men do this. We kind of beat around the bush and we don't really say what we want or we expect a person to read our mind. This song is literally telling the man or the significant other, whoever the, this person may be for the listener, what I want them to do and how I want them to do it. So it's just a very clear message. Did you write this? Like, did you compose this record? Were you in a studio with someone? How, how did it all come about? Yes. So I've I've written I've written every song on my project. Um, every song that you guys hear that me, that I put out, I I wrote them. Um, and I wrote them with um, K Major. He's a okay, producer okay, and a songwriter. Okay. That he's like my bro. He's so dope. He's so cool. And we just click. Like we'll sit down. We'll come up with a concept. I'll come up with a melody. He'll be like, oh, I got a hook, or I'll say I have the hook, and he'll be like, oh, I got the verse, and then I have the second verse. Or We just work so well together. So I really can't see myself making more albums without him being a part of the process. So shout out to Kim Major. We're quickly approaching the year 2024. Like we're, mm -hmm. Thanksgiving is right around the corner. Next thing yes. you know, Christmas and New Year's will be here. You're releasing new music. You're consistently mm -hmm. working on new things. What are some of your goals, both, both personally and professionally, getting ready to move into a new year, a new season? Um, I love this question, but I also hate it because I'm really trying to revel in the present moment of what's going on. I'm really trying to not be so much in the future that I'm not acknowledging what's happening. A lot of times we forget what we've accomplished in the past because the, the present is telling us, oh, that's old. That's, you know, that was back in the day or that was before. Like what you doing now or what you doing next? So I'm really just trying to appreciate what I've accomplished thus far, where I am right now and be focused not solely focused, but be focused on making decisions that are going to impact me positively in the future. So I do have some plans in the okay. future, but I'm not gonna reveal them yet because you know, everybody ain't happy for you. You know what I'm saying? When you growing and you glowing, you know what I'm saying? So, yeah. So if, um, if you had a perfect or the ideal situation where you could work with any producer, any artist, Past, present, or future, you can get mm -hmm. into the studio, either create, just say like a three, four song LP, okay. or, um, or even more lengthier project. Who would that artist or producer be, and why? Why would you decide I to work with them? I would definitely want to go in the studio with Kanye West. He okay. is the consummate artist, like producer, singer, rapper, songwriter, creative. He's just so creative. Like, I know for a fact, if we got in the studio, we would make a masterpiece, okay. for sure. <laughs> Looking and, at, he, and he's unapologetically himself, which I really love that about him. He is Kanye. very much so that. You can hear that in his music. Some of my friends joke and they say I'm the Kanye of the, of the girl group, but yeah. Looking at yourself now, where you are as a woman and as an artist, um, what would you tell to, I'll say, the 10-year-old the version of yourself? I would say um, listen to the voice inside. Don't let outside influences impact your decisions. Um, never be pressured into doing something or saying something that's not something you actually believe in and you can do whatever you want yeah that's what i would say for your current fans people who will become fans as you continue to grow in music and what and after they watch our interview uh, how could they check you out via social media stream some of your music or check out some of your videos and, and such on youtube well, you can access my music on Spotify, Apple, Tidal, Pandora, Amazon, wherever you get your music online, my music is out there. It's a whole mood, it's dance with me. It's just type in Torica and you will see all of the grand sounds, the imagery. My YouTube is Torica's World, my Instagram is Torica's World, my website is Torica's World.com. It's Torica's World, so come into my world. 
Well, we appreciate you bringing a piece of your world in here with us today. Thank you. And you know, we'll certainly stay in tune in what you have going on. and look forward to speaking with you again. Yay. Bye. Thank you guys for tuning in.